This is a recording of Peter Staudenmeyer describing the anarchism of fools conspiracy theory as a substitute for social critique. He spoke at the 2004 Renewing the Anarchist Tradition Conference at Goddard College in Plainfield, Vermont, on September 26, 2004. Conspiracy theory continues to enjoy a generally positive reception within many sectors of the contemporary North American anarchist movement. As this presentation will argue, conspiracy models of social reality consistently distort and obscure the power relations they purport to explain. Instead of examining or refuting specific instances of conspiracy thinking within the popular anarchist milieu, this analysis will concentrate on the logical structure of conspiracy theory as such, and attempt to illuminate its psychological, political, philosophical, and historical roots. Peter Staudenmeyer is an anarchist historian whose work focuses on modern European right-wing thought. He teaches at the Institute for Social Ecology. Well, we are starting late. I'm Peter. I'm Peter Staudenmeyer. I'm the, I'm the presenter. We're starting late, so what I'm going to try to do is, um, as much as possible, condense what I had to say down even more than I already tried to condense it so that we don't just run out of time. I'd really like to have some solid, good dis discussion time given a, given a topic like this on which there are so many different views, especially because the view that I'm going to be presenting is, is uh, very partisan, very, very one-sided. So if I go too fast on something, I also have a tendency to talk fast when I'm, when I'm doing public speaking. If I go too fast on something, just uh, interrupt me, raise your hand, or say, could you say that again, or could you slow down, or whatever. Um, so maybe I'll try to do a half hour and then we can use the rest of the time for the discussion from then on in. This is the title of the workshop is The Anarchism of Fools, Conspiracy Theory as a Substitute for Social Critique. And, and a little later in the discussion, we can, we can talk about where I got that title from. Some of you probably know the, the historical resonance of that phrase or of a variant of that phrase. And what I'd like to do is begin my own spiel about the matter with a quote from a radical German philosopher named Theodore Adorno. Adorno was a, a sort of a left-wing social thinker who also did a lot of work on music. And in the 1930s, he tried to write a book about Richard Wagner, the, the composer, the great 19th century German composer, Wagner. And I don't know if folks know this about Wagner, but Wagner, in addition to writing what I think is very incredibly beautiful music, also had some incredibly reactionary politics. He was a towering figure on the, on the German far right at the time and had a substantial influence on the folks who eventually became the Nazis after his death. Um, Wagner in his early years also had, well, not even just in his early years, Wagner throughout his life had this interesting flirtation going on with anarchist politics and anarchist thinking. When he was very young in the, in the middle of the 1948, 1949, uh, 1848, 1849, sorry, get my centuries mixed up. In the middle of the revolutionary period, a lot of upheaval going on in Central Europe at that time, Wagner was sort of friends and comrades and associates with Michael Bakunin. They fought together on the barricades for a while in, in Dresden, for example, in, in what is now Germany. Um, and Wagner also had throughout his life this strong uh, attraction to what we would today call conspiracy theories. They didn't call them conspiracy theories back then, but that's, you know, what we would classify them as today. So Adorno, writing 50 years after Wagner's death, is trying to make sense of this weird combination in this one, in this one sort of great man kind of figure, this one great composer figure, makes sense of that weird combination between really beautiful goodness, the really beautiful music, and really scary evilness in, in the form of his, some of his politics. And one of the conclusions that Adorno came to to try to understand that weird connection was that in Adorno's words, any time, the way that Adorno puts it is that any thinker, no matter what their intentions are going into the matter, but any thinker will end up reaching inevitably reactionary consequences, according to Adorno, whenever institutionalized social relationships appear as the work of hidden conspiracies. And that's the quote that I want to use to set the, the tone for the day. Whenever institutionalized social relationships appear as the work of hidden conspiracies, says Adorno, it ends up having really regressive and scary consequences. And I more or less take that position myself, and I want to spend the next 23 minutes or so explaining why. Anarchists have a very, very long history of association, not all of us, but a lot of anarchists have a very long history of association with that kind of conspiratorial thinking. You might say that if you want to go back to, uh, again, going back to Bakunin's early years, ever since Bakunin and Nechayev sort of paired up, we've had a little problem with 
Anarchists have had a little problem with conspiracism. But in fact, I'd say that it goes back considerably longer than that, even back into the late medieval, early modern period, before there was even a term like anarchism in current use. One of the best historical sources for folks who have an interest in this sort of background to our own movement, one of the best historical sources about that sort of early pre-anarchist, anarchist thinking is a book by a, a, a famous historian, Norman Cohn, called The Pursuit of the Millennium. Anarchists who read this book have to read it against the grain. Cohn himself is no anarchist by any means. Uh, in fact, he's in some ways downright hostile to what we would today call anarchist politics. But it's an amazing source of information on that, on that set of worldviews and that set of movements, especially, again, in, in Central Europe. And one of the things that Cohn strongly um, emphasizes in his work is the connection between that libertarian form of politics and the, uh, the temptations of a conspiratorial mindset. He, ca he calls it millennialism, which is technically something different, but in Cohn's work, the two are, are very tightly combined. Uh, and I think that's accurate. As much as I disagree with Cohn's own political approach to the problem, I think his, his, his historianship is, is on target. There is a very long-standing connection, historical and internal connection, between anarchist ways of viewing the world and anarchist ways of trying to change the world and the temptation to think about the world in more or less conspiratorial terms. And I'd say that that has left, that that combination has left an ambivalent legacy for North American anarchists today. On the one hand, that temptation to use, to rely on conspiratorial models of the world can, I think, actually offer a really interesting source of what you might call counter knowledge. When we are confronted with a social reality that gets reflected to us through the media, through mainstream newspapers, through television, et cetera, et cetera, it's, which we all know is an extremely restricted way of getting accurate information about the rest of the world, it can seem like drawing on these alternative histories and these alternative narratives about what's really going on in the world today, some of which end up having a, a, a conspiratorial cast to them, that can be uh, a way of puncturing through that sort of mainstream, I guess you could call it censorship, or that mainstream domination about what we are allowed to think about, what we are allowed to believe about how the world works, and for that matter, the kinds of associations that we are allowed to engage in with one another. Sometimes, when you want to get stuff done effectively in a society like the contemporary United States, let's say, and I'm going to guess that this applies to Canada as well, I'm not sure, but sometimes when you want to get stuff done and the stuff that you want to get done is technically illegal, well then it's a good idea not to tell the authorities that you're doing it. And that puts you in, and many of us I think have probably been in this position ourselves, that puts you in technically a conspiratorial position. You're going to be working together with your comrades on some project or other and you're not exactly going to go down to the local cop shop or the local district attorney and say, hey, just want to let you know, we're, we're working on this project and whatever. So a lot of us have direct real-life experience being effectively conspirators. And what I say in the rest of, uh, of my remarks today is not at all intended to make light of or to, for that matter, to even criticize that kind of activism. It's the same thing that I do in, in my own uh, activist life. What I want to do instead is draw on the other and sort of um, uh, subject to criticism and subject to uh, a much stronger examination is draw on the other side of that ambivalent legacy. And that's the side of the legacy of conspiracism within contemporary anarchist milieus that I think is actually dangerous and is a temptation that we ought to be resisting rather than, you know, allowing ourselves to fall into. And that side I see as one that hooks up with some very deeply regressive trends within the broader North American political culture. And the main trend that I have in mind there is the history of right-wing populism. I, I don't know how, many, how, how much folks here have a good sort of background knowledge about that tradition of right-wing populism. It's a very prominent part of U.S. history. It's a very prominent part of Canadian history. I was just talking, phooey, who was I talking with yesterday? One of our Canadian comrades was, uh, was talking about Alberta. Um, we were talking about the, the history of the social credit movement. I don't know if the Canadian comrades in the room know about that from the 1930s and 1940s. Um, the U.S. instance usually have to go back more to like the 1880s and 1890s and go to the old populist party. Um, a lot of the best scholarship on those um, populist movements has emphasized the weird ways in which they brought together left-wing themes and I guess for the rest you have to do left-wing themes and right-wing <laughs> themes and married them together within this, this discourse of the people versus the elites. That's the sort of basic uh, paradigm of 
populist politics. Again, without disparaging that tradition in its entirety, I think that that way of viewing the world sometimes has wrapped up in it some, again, what I call some very deeply regressive trends that I think anarchists today want to avoid and want to critique and want to spend our times working away from rather than uh, converging with and, and working into. Um, one of the more prominent liberal historians of the populist tradition is a guy named Richard Hofstetter. I brought one of his books here today. In the 1960s, Hofstetter wrote a very influential article, article called The Paranoid Style in American Politics, and it then became, this, this book is called The Paranoid Style in American Politics. It leads off with that essay and then has a, a dozen more essays. Uh, Hofstetter was a, uh, a good political tactician, and he arranged to have his, the original version of his article published in November 1964. And those who pay attention, which you don't have to, but those who pay attention to U.S. presidential elections may well remember that in November 1964, the people on the ballot were Lyndon Johnson, the guy who actually won, and who was the other guy? Goldwater. Goldwater, Barry Goldwater, a perfect example of the, the breakthrough of a sort of far-right political thinking into the U.S. political mainstream, hardly the first and hardly the last uh, such breakthrough. So Hofstetter basically had in mind, let's uh, put out there for a broader reading public just how scary and dangerous the kind of thinking that we see in the Goldwater campaign today, uh, just how long that has been around in our political culture. And one of the things that Hofstetter does at the beginning of that article is he goes through these five separate examples where he just gives these paragraph long quotes, one from the 1950s, one from the 1890s, one from the 1850s, and one from the 1790s. And they are all strikingly similar quotes. They're all about the conspiratorial, the small cabal of evildoers who are conspiring to take over our country and ruin the fine institutions on which it is, it is based. So he's able to show a very, very striking set of similar discourses throughout these very different, these very disparate parts of, of US history. And just to give up one really brief example of that, this is actually not taken from Hofstetter's work, but from uh, Franz Neumann's work. There was, uh, folks know who Grover Cleveland was? For the, for the Canadians in the audience, Cleveland was one of our less significant uh, presidents, just not a very important guy in, in, the, in the general scheme of things. Populist leaders back in the day, they even denounced Grover Cleveland, of all people, as, quote, the agent of Jewish bankers and British gold, end quote. Uh, I like that quote because it so succinctly brings together two of the most prominent themes within right-wing populist and conspiratorial thinking, namely Jewish bankers, we'll get back to the whole Jewish theme in, in a little bit, but also British gold. There's also this foreign power. It's not just the internal enemy, the Jews, the internal minority, who are conspiring against us, quote unquote, but it's also some foreign power, whether it's the British or the French or the Pope or whoever, the Queen of England or the Freemasons, they are conspiring against us in order to, to, to ruin our, our grand way of life. Now, you might say, in fact, um, some of the people that I've had this argument with over the years have in fact said, well, that's just an example of a bad conspiracy theory. Grover Cleveland was not, in fact, the tool of Jewish bankers or of <laughs> British gold, whatever British gold is supposed to be. Um, so it's just an example of a failed conspiracy theory. It's an example of a conspiracy theory that, that doesn't have any purchase on reality and that's really kind of obviously silly, but that example does not in itself demonstrate what is wrong with, what, what Peter Stoudemire thinks is wrong with conspiracy theory as such. And that's a fair point. I actually think that's, that's true. After all, it is not the case that all conspiracy theories are necessarily anti-Semitic. It is not the case that all conspiracy theories necessarily invoke some foreign power who's going to corrupt our way of life. That's an eminently reasonable response. And in light of that response, what I want to try to do with the rest of my time today is, to the extent possible, abstract away from particular instances of conspiracy theories. So not try to talk about, well, was Grover Cleveland really a tool of the Jews or of the British? But instead, abstract away from the particular claims that are made in different instances of conspiracy thinking and try to look at the more general themes, the basic patterns that I think I see in most versions of contemporary conspiracy thinking, and for that matter, the basic presuppositions that underlie most in instances of contemporary conspiracy thinking. So for better or worse, the rest of my presentation is going to be fairly abstract, although I'll try to spice it up with a couple of real world and very recent examples from time to time. Now before I give you my little catalog, I'm going to try to isolate about 10 different elements, very briefly isolate, 10 different elements that I think animate the conspiratorial worldview as such, or what you might call the conspiratorial mindset 
as such. But I should say at the outset that it is not the case that all of those elements, all of those 10 or so elements, necessarily appear in their entirety or in their fully fledged form in every instance of contemporary conspiracy thinking. In fact, one of the striking things about conspiracism is its amazing elasticity. It's an incredibly elastic mental construct. And what I mean is that it can expand or contract to fit the occasion. For folks who take conspiracy theories seriously and build them into their own political analysis, into their own worldview, there is often a very impressive ability to apply a conspiratorial framework in some instances, but not in other instances. And when it is applied in some instances, it will sort of um, again, expand to fill the available space. Well, we don't know this, we don't know that, we don't know these particular facts because they've been withheld from us. So let's fill in that apparent gap with a conspiracy theory, but then it won't necessarily go and govern their entire analysis of the world as a whole. And I'll try to say a few things more about that in a moment. So, without further ado, if I can just lay out what I think are these, um, and again, I might have missed a bunch. For that matter, some of you might think that some of the things that I'm going to isolate as supposedly uh, primary foundational elements of conspiracy thinking that I'm dead wrong about and they don't in fact apply. And in that case, I will encourage folks to bring that up in the, in the discussion. Um, I will also try to say a little bit about how each of these ideas relates to the other. They're all pretty closely interrelated. The first one I would say is a rejection of contingency a rejection of the notion that some things happen for a series of reasons that aren't particularly clear-cut. In fact, sometimes things happen for reasons that we can't even determine with any uh, precision with, or with any reliability. Um, the conspiratorial notion is basically that seemingly random sets of events are in fact part of a grand design, that they were arranged to fit together into a certain pattern. Whereas I would say that, in fact, social reality quite often does not work according to anybody's design. It doesn't work according to the design of the powerful or the design of the powerless. It doesn't work according to natural laws. It doesn't work according to the laws of physics. It just works because social reality, as I'll get to in a moment, is a fantastically complex set of interlocking dynamics, and those dynamics don't always fit easily together. So contingency is the, is, the, is the kind of thinking that I'm going to put up as a positive alternative to the non-contingent way of looking at the world that I see as part of conspiracist uh, frameworks. The second thing is that I think a lot of conspiracies posit a false dichotomy between, on the one hand, coincidence, and on the other hand, conspiracy. It has to be one or the other to a conspiratorial mindset. Either everything that happens is just utterly random chance, that's the sort of the bad kind of contingency. There's no meaningful connection between anything, or the other possibility is it's all part of a deliberate and intentional and, again, designed sort of conspiracy. Everything is either uh, sort of uh, utter randomness or it's premeditated and masterminded. And that leads us to a third, what I see as a third misunderstanding of social reality within conspiracist frameworks, and that is a, misunder a misunderstanding of both what contingency really means in a complex society like ours, and especially what intentionality means, what it means for social actors to have intentions and to act upon them. Um, there is often, I think, in our world, often a very common gap, sometimes a large gap, between the goals that people set for themselves and the results that they actually achieve. And what I think is the case is that gap is also present for very powerful people. That gap is present for the President of the United States or the <coughs> folks who are in charge of NATO or wh whoever runs the Pentagon or the people on the board of directors of Exxon and of I don't know, name your other favorite super, super uh, transnational corporation, even extremely powerful people experience an important gap between what they want to get done in the world, between their goals and what they are actually able to achieve. And one of my, one of my hypotheses here is that conspiracy theory narrows that gap down until it just about completely disappears. In a conspiracy framework, well, if the powerful people want to get something done, they're going to get it done. It's just going to magically happen because they have the power to to make it happen. Another way of saying that same criticism of conspiracy thinking is to say that conspiracy theory does not account for fallibility, 
for the ability of people to really just fuck up. Even extremely powerful people fuck up. They make mistakes. They think that they're going to go into Afghanistan and get A, B, and C done, but in fact they go into Afghanistan and they get X, Y, and Z, which is not what they wanted to happen. That sort of fallibility I see as a constitutive element of the way social reality works today, and it's sort of the opposite of what you would think is really happening on the basis of reading conspiracy theory uh, versions of reality. The fourth point would be, um, I guess you could call a difference between elaborateness on the one hand and complexity on the other hand. A lot of conspiracy theories look like they are very complex. They have lots and lots and lots of details and they try to make those details fit together in this pretty intricate stream. You almost sometimes when you read conspiracy theories, it's like you want a flow chart to see, well, what, what board member of this group was actually at the same time working for that group which was at that time involved in some investment over here, while the military over here was, you need, you need these you know, amazing arrows and things to keep things together. Now that looks like a kind of complexity. What I'm gonna argue is that in fact, it's a way of flattening out the real complexity. It sort of replaces elaborateness with actual complexity. And what I mean by that is, to my mind, um, in a really genuinely complex society, which ours is, both in wonderful and amazing and great ways that we want to preserve, and also in awful and terrible ways that we want to eventually change, um, there are good and bad kinds of complexity. But for better or worse, the kind of complexity in a society like ours means that the lines of causation are often not at all straightforward. It is often very difficult not just to figure out what caused what, but in fact, what caused what is not a simple question in a society like ours. Often, event X was caused by, I don't know, 17 other factors, some of them really major, some of them apparently minor. It's very hard to draw any direct connections. You can't have a flow chart that explains our kind of social reality because a flow chart just has this one dimension. You have one arrow pointing from this discrete object to that discrete object. That's just not the way social action really happens much of the time in our society. Sometimes it does, but a lot of the time it doesn't. So I think that the conspiracy theory, while purporting to be more and more complex is actually in a significant sense less complex than it would need to be. And next I would say that one of the main um, sort of logical connectors, argumentative connectors that conspiracy theory relies on is the notion of plausibility. Very often conspiracy theorists will use plausibility as their, I guess you could say, their, their chief connecting link between the apparently disparate, the apparently really different and distant phenomena that they try to bring together. Very frequently, if you pay close attention to conspiratorial texts in particular, or even if you just listen to them on the radio, very often you will get this sense of, well, we actually can't demonstrate, we can't, we can't actually prove, we can't demonstrate any direct link between these two or three or five seemingly disparate events, but isn't it likely? Isn't it possible? Can't you see how they would fit together if you just accept that, you know, figure X was in the right place at the right time and could have done what our theory suggests that she or he did do? So that notion of plausibility is really, really central to bringing the point home within a conspiracy framework. And that is closely related to, this is, this is possibly the single most um, consistent and prominent element within conspiracist thinking, the notion that conspiracy theories very often rely on insinuation and innuendo instead of relying on evidence and argument. What I mean by that, when I say insinuation and innuendo, and I'm a, and I'm a person who makes copious use of insinuation and innuendo in, in other, in polemical contexts, and I'm a big fan of, of using those as, as a way of sort of getting a point across. What I'm saying is that when we're doing our own analysis, when, when we're trying to figure out what's actually happening in the world so that we can effectively change what's happening in the world, that, that's a bad point to use insinuendo and innuation. And what I mean there is that conspiracy theories will classically suggest a conclusion rather than stating it. That's the classic conspiratorial, conspiratorial trope, is to suggest it to the audience, but don't, don't necessarily actually state it outright. If you've read a lot of conspiracist texts, like actually written forms of conspiracy theories, you will see a striking frequency of ellipses. Ellipses are when you have a dot, 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 
like you're about to end a sentence, but instead of actually ending it, you just go dot, dot, dot. That's a perfect example of suggesting the conclusion to the sentence without actually saying it. If you actually state the end of the sentence, then you have to sort of back it up and show how step one leads to step two, leads to step three, and they all support the conclusion that you're actually stating. If you avoid stating the conclusion, you can just rely on all the other elements we looked at and say, well, isn't it plausible that it could have happened that way? And you sort of invite the audience to draw the conclusions themselves without you actually having to put it forward. Um, next, I would say, and very closely related to that, is conspiracy theories often replace precision. They replace a, a precise analysis of, of difficult and intricate details with instead sort of, I guess you could call it, uh, sort of arbitrary details. And here I do want to give a specific example. Have folks seen Michael Moore's latest movie, Fahrenheit 911? I don't know if you remember, but there's a point, and I'm going to have a lot more to say about that movie in a moment, but there's one small point in that movie where you, are, you have this statistic tossed at you, and I, it's been months since I saw the movie, so I might have the statistic wrong in my mind, but what, I, what sticks in my memory is this notion that 13% of the U.S. economy is owned by the Saudis. I don't know if it's 13 percent or 9 I forget what the figure is, but you get this random detail sort of tossed at you as if it told you something really important about the world. And I'm watching the movie and I'm thinking to myself, 13 percent, huh, I wonder what percentage of the U.S. economy is owned by the Dutch or the Belgians. I, I actually have, I have no idea what percentage, but for that matter, I wonder the other way around, what percentage of the economies of the Middle East is owned by U.S.-based corporations? I'm betting it's higher than 13%, but again, I don't really know, and you're not given any of that context within, within Michael Moore's movie. Instead, you just have this 13% is owned by the Saudis, you have it sort of thrown at you. So I see that as, as an example of missing the point of, 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 a, of a detail like that, because it's not really precise in that context, and it's just sort of free-floating out there, and instead you just sort of give an arbitrary or, or, or random details. Um, now that leads us on to, to, to continue with the Michael Moore example, that leads us on to one of the really, really less savory elements within classic standard contemporary conspiracist discourse, and that is the idea that very often a conspiracy theorist will basically encourage the audience to draw their own inference. Again, don't state the conclusion, but just suggest it. And in order to help that, in order to help the audience to draw what the conspiracy theorist thinks is the proper conclusion, is the correct conclusion, conspiracy theories will very frequently invoke pre-existing preconceptions about particular groups of people that are presumed to be present in the audience's mind or in the mind of a lot of members of the audience, let's put it that way. And now the classic way that that usually happens traditionally, if you give a sort of historical overview of, of conspiracy theories throughout the century, the classic group onto which those existing presuppositions, you might call them existing prejudices, are then projected in conspiracy thinking is usually the Jews. But in today's world, it's very, very, especially in today's United States, it's very, very common to get a very similar sort of preconceptions projected onto uh, different uh, social groups. In Michael Moore's movie, the group that I see as sort of being the, the, the butt of all those preconceptions is Arabs. Muslims doesn't quite do the trick for his movie. In fact, Muslims is, a, is such a heterogeneous category that it, it, doesn't, it doesn't quite do the trick for most conspiracy theorists, although some have tried over the last three years. But in Michael Moore's movie, it's more just this diffuse no notion of Arab people. You see all these pictures of George Bush the elder, George Bush the senior, sitting down to coffee and shaking hands with and smiling with a bunch of Arab men. And all you know about them is that they're Arab men. Why? Because they look like Arabs. They're presented as Arabs. They're wearing those things that they wear. They have facial hair. And that they, you are, uh, what Moore is doing is mobilizing a set of preconceptions on the part of his mostly white North American audience about what Arabs are like, and then using that pre-existing set of conceptions to uh, invite the audience to draw the desired inference, namely, the, to, to, to draw the desired conclusion, namely that, wow, those Arabs and George Bush must be up to no good because, look, they are meeting in these secret places and they're all smiling and they're happy and they must be conspiring about something because that's what those shifty Arabs do or something like that. Um, okay, I'm running out of time, so I wanna, I wanna speed things up a little bit. Um, one element from that last example in Fahrenheit 911 that I think is important to highlight is that conspiracy theory very often invokes a logic of association. Not necessarily even, people are very used to the, to the phrase guilt by association, but there's lots of other sorts of associational logic available to us. And not even necessarily guilt by association, sometimes it can even be innocence by association, sort of the opposite. But in any case, it depends on this notion of a, of a logic of association. And what I mean by that is that conspiracy theory will take an incredibly complex social constellation. It'll, it'll take a 
a very complicated social reality as a whole, and it will focus on one part of that social reality, more or less in isolation from all the other parts, and then conspiracy theory will invest that one part of the complex whole with enormous significance and will ask us to focus on this one you know, really, really import of, uh, important part of the entire whole. What I think that is, is a sort of political counterpart to the psychoanalytic notion of displacement. And I don't know how much folks know uh, Sigmund Freud's work here, but anyone, anyone have a good, a good knowledge of the notion of displacement that they want to share with us? A one sentence, who has a one sentence definition of displacement? <laughs> the, the idea behind, any, has anyone ever read, has anyone ever read any Freud? Come on, people. Anyone, anyone know his, his sort of early essay called Screen Memories? So what, it's a delightful essay. For years before I read that essay, I, I was convinced that that essay was about movies. It was about the cinema. <laughs> because in English, it's called Screen Memories. And that was totally wrong on my part. For one thing, it was written in 1899 before there really were any movies. For another thing, he wrote it in German. And the word that he uses in German isn't screen. It's, yeah, deck I always say that, uh, covered up memories. It's not about screens. Anyway, it should be about movies, though, because of the, the content of the essay. What Freud tries to do there is to say that what, what Freud says screen memories are, if you remember something from your childhood. I have a memory from my childhood of my mother hanging up clothes on the, on the, I had this, you know, suburban childhood, hanging up clothes on the clothesline to dry. And I remember there were like pink, I don't know, bed sheets or something that she was hanging up to dry. And that's all I remember from this particular moment. Why would I have that memory from when I was four, sitting in the backyard watching my mother hang the laundry? According to Freud's theory, which you don't have to buy, but according to Freud's theory, the basic idea is you contain, you, you retain that memory in your head because it is associated with, speaking of a logical association, it is associated with some much more important memory that your, uh, that your mind is basically repressed because that important memory was like too much for you to handle of the tender young age of four, but because it was important enough, your brain, your mind did actually retain this marker of that more important memory, which happened right before it or right after it, or because your mother was involved or because, I don't know, because the bed sheets were pink or something. There's some sort of connecting thing to the, to the repressed memory. And that has a lot to do with, with Freud's notion of displacement. Displacement is basically when you take the emotional import of one, uh, phenomenon in your life and you displace it onto a different phenomenon. You invest that meaning into something else that is happening. And I see this logic of association that conspiracy theory so frequently invokes, I see that as sort of the political counterpart to that psychological me uh, mechanism of displacement. Okay, finishing up here. Um, Another guy that I should mention who was actually a, a, a friend and colleague of Theodor Adorno's is a fellow named Franz Neumann, N-E-U-M-A-N-N. -N. Uh, Neumann was a, a sort of a political scientist. And Neumann wrote a very important essay about conspiracy theory again in the 1960s called Anxiety and Politics. And in that essay, he identifies something that he calls false concreteness. I really like that phrase. It's a, it's a good phrase. It's a perceptive phrase. False concreteness as a characteristic of conspiracy thinking. And what Neumann meant by that is that conspiracy theories very frequently will personify broad historical processes. That because it's really hard to talk in a direct and easily accessible way about things like, I don't know, a phenomenon like patriarchy, which extends over thousands of years in a wild variety of cultural contexts and shows up in really, really, really different ways depending on the historical and cultural context. It's hard to talk about an underlying historical dynamic like patriarchy. It's much easier if we can personify that in the person of some identifiable, identifiable concrete set of bad people who are doing bad things. And the problem becomes even, even worse, I think, well, this is jumping ahead a little bit, becomes even worse in the case of, of uh, uh, broader social phenomena like capitalism, for example. In any case, Neumann's notion that false concreteness is involved is, I think, a perfect, a perfect way of describing what happens in a lot of conspiracy theories. They seem really concrete. They seem like, yeah, you can sink your teeth into that. You can get your hands around what conspiracy theorists say is really happening in the world, but it's a false way of presenting that. It's a, it's, it's, it's a deceptive way of presenting what's actually happening in the world because unfortunately a lot of what happens in social reality is hard to get our minds around. It's hard to sink our teeth into. It's hard to find really concrete and easily accessible ways of talking about it. Okay, my last point is going to be, to get a little bit more concrete myself, my last point is going to be the notion of the telling detail. Conspiracy theory really depends often quite centrally on the notion of the telling detail. And by telling, I mean the one really revealing 
detail, or sometimes it's like three or four really revealing details. The notion there is that this one fact about social reality, once we have discovered it, once we have managed to unmask it, it will illuminate everything else that is supposedly happening behind the scenes. If you just pull on this one thread long enough, if you look at 911, and if you see that something weird happened that day at the Pentagon that just doesn't somehow fit into the rest of the narrative, which is certainly the case, even after that whole ridiculous uh, congressional report about what happened that day, the whole 900-page thing. If you read through, I haven't actually read through all that stuff, but if you read through a lot of that stuff, you still are left with a couple of questions. How could they possibly be that stupid that they allowed that to happen, and, and how did this weird thing happen at that time, et cetera? There's a bunch of unanswered questions that are, that are hard to make fit into a coherent narrative. And according to a conspiratorial mindset, if you can sort of focus on one of those unanswered questions, and you grab onto that thread, and you just pull it long enough, the idea is that that alone will unravel the whole hidden structure and eventually we'll be able to reveal aha, what was really going on on 911 was such and such and, and, and so and so. Okay, so those were sort of my, my little mini uh, catalog of what I think the basic characteristics of conspiracy thinking are. And to, to, to try to wrap up what I what I think are the problems with those uh, particular characteristics. I would say that the result of all those 10 or 11 different things is a tendency to hold specific and identifiable, and again, concrete social groups responsible for what seem to be inexplicable aspects of the social world, and usually the really detrimental aspects of the social world. I am often in agreement with a very wide range of conspiracy theorists, including some right-wing conspiracy theorists. I am often in agreement with them about what is screwed up about our social reality. Not all the time, but a lot of the time I agree with them. The difference comes in how do we analyze what accounts for that uh, for that screwed upness. Is it actually the case that there is a, some sort of small, separate, identifiable group of people whose bad actions are, are, at the, are at the root of the problem? Or is, in fact, the problem a much, much trickier one of, and this is my, and this is my own position, a much, much trickier one of underlying social relationships, underlying social structures that go well beyond the specific intentions or the specific actions of any identifiable group. In other words, it's a difference between if we if we sort of rounded up Dick Cheney and George Bush and the whole gang and sent them into exile somewhere else, as if any other place on the earth would actually have them, sent them to the moon, sent them into exile on the moon, would that in and of itself have any appreciable effect on what actually happens in our social world? Well, maybe it would have some, but would it actually change the underlying social structures? My argument is no. The tendency of conspiracy theory, even when it doesn't actually say this outright, the whole tendency of conspiracy theory is to answer that question, yes. Basically, if you can find the cabal of evildoers who are screwing up our otherwise basically decent and good social institutions, if you can find that group, isolate it and eliminate it and make them mend their corrupt ways or make sort of kick them out of office so that they're no longer too able to pursue their corrupt ends, then that will solve the problem right then and there. I see that as the basic tendency, again, even when it's not articulated, I see that as the basic tendency of pretty much all uh, conspiracy thinking. Now the analysis that I laid down, the last 100 words, the last two minutes of what I just said, that has been said in detail and repeatedly by lots of other left figures in the U.S. over the last two decades. Noam Chomsky is an excellent example. I love bringing up Chomsky in this context because when I argue with my parents, for example, who are you know, sort of boring liberals and don't have an anarchist bone in their bodies. When I argue with them, and I'll make some what appears to them to be an extremely outlandish claim about how I think our society works, they'll dismiss it with a wave of the hand and say, oh, that's just conspiracy theory. And when I try to give them like a little bit of Chomsky, Chomsky can sometimes be a, a good wedge into that kind of thinking because he's a more accessible writer than some others are. You give them some Chomsky and they'll read him and they'll say, oh, that sounds like a conspiracy theory to me. When in fact Chomsky has been admirably consistent for decades about, well, no, in his nice calm demeanor, well, no, actually, the analysis I'm presenting is an institutional analysis. It's pretty much the logical opposite of a conspiracy analysis. He is especially consistent, I may point out, when he is out and about giving public talks, which he spends an enormous amount of his time doing, giving public talks around the world, he'll very often draw a bunch of local conspiracy conspiracists to his talks. I, I lived for many years in Madison, Wisconsin. Whenever Chomsky came to town, the conspiracists came out of the woodwork and they showed up at, at his talk basically because they saw him as one of their 
comrade. They saw him as basically <coughs> underwriting their own claims about reality. And every once in a while, in the question and answer period, they'd stand up and they'd give their own little, you know, favorite personal pref preferred version of the conspiracy theory. And Chomsky would very calmly explain why what they were saying was in fact incompatible with what he was saying. I love the fact that he's very, he's very, very good about that. So we have Chomsky as a very prominent, you know, figure on the more anarchistically uh, oriented end of, of left-wing politics in this country. But we also have people like Michael Albert, one of, the, one of the founders of Z Magazine, who's been extremely consistent and extremely, again, extremely detailed and extremely clear about this matter for many, many years, explaining what is wrong with conspiracy theory, why it undercuts an in institutional analysis. We have people like Chip Burlett and Matt Lyons. I don't know if folks know them, but if you want a really excellent introduction to the history of right-wing populism in the U.S., the best book in my mind is Chip Burlett. Burlett's name is B. E-R-L-E-T, and Nat Lyons, L-Y-O-N-S, and their book is simply called, what is it, Right-Wing Populism in America? Do you remember, Ian? I think it's Right-Wing Populism in America, a fine book. In that book and in the other public work that they have done online and in published texts, Burlett and Lyons have been for years laying down the analysis that I just said here. Nevertheless, many anarchists in, t in the contemporary U.S. continue to have a more or less hostile reaction to that analysis. The classic example is, did anybody read the spring 2004 issue of the Fifth Estate? I think it was the spring issue. It came out in like April or March, but it might have been the winter issue. I can't remember. That, nobody here read it? You've got to go pick that up. That was the conspiracy issue. And it had, unfortunately, I, I just moved across the country a month ago, and I, I have this issue of the Fifth Estate somewhere at the bottom of some box, but I could not find it before I had to come here. I wanted to pass it around and show it to everybody. It's the whole issue is about conspiracy theories. And the most interesting and most substantive article in the issue is, shit, I can't remember the title or who the authors were. I apologize. It was months ago that I read it. But the whole thing is a rebuttal of Michael Elberts and Noam Chomsky's and Chip Burlett and Matt Lyons' take on what's wrong with conspiracy theories. It's an attempt to recuperate, to rejuvenate conspiracy theories and to argue to the anarchist milieu, well, don't listen to those other boring, fuddy-duddy leftists over there. Let's, let's grasp the radical potential of conspiracy theories. I think that's uh, you know, pretty much exactly the wrong way to go. And there's three reasons that I want to leave us with for why I think, so we can actually have some, some discussion, why I think that sort of conspiratorial thinking continues to enjoy a generally positive reception among some sectors of the U.S. anarchist, well, the North American anarchist milieu today. And the three reasons I would point to is one, the anarchist tradition, I think, just doesn't have a particularly strong tradition of sophisticated theoretical analysis. I wish that that were different, and a lot of folks at this conference, for example, are, are in the midst of working to change that, but for better or worse, I just think it's a fact about our tradition that we should all pretty much sit down and face. We have some wonderful political history. We have amazing uh, uh, activists and revolutionaries in our uh, pantheon, so to speak. We have a lot of things to be very, very proud of within our own traditions, within our own histories, but we don't have a particularly well-articulated or let's say, a particularly sophisticated or refined examples. We have some of them, but not very many examples of really hard theoretical works about an institutional analysis of society. Instead, that has very often been left to the Marxist tradition. Marxists, like go, many Marxists, not all of them, sort of go overboard on that question and, and pay attention to nothing but the institutional analysis. And I'm sort of thinking that in this weird sort of negative symbiosis, anarchists have said, well, let's leave that stuff to the Marxists. They'll figure out political economy, and we can go work on overthrowing the state and doing all that stuff. And in a way, that's led to this problem where we don't have a lot of our own models to draw on when we are confronted with problems that basically require a pretty sophisticated theoretical apparatus in order to uh, crack them open. And the next thing I would say is that conspiracy theory often, let's make this the last thing I will say, conspiracy theory often serves a kind of compensatory function psychologically and in our personal lives because we do in fact live in the sort of society that systematically disempowers most of us in everyday ways, in particularly striking ways when you're confronted with a guy who's got a badge or a gun or something like that, but in lots of very subtle and mundane ways too, we are systematically deprived of effective power over our own lives. That's the reason we all became anarchists. And at the same time, we are very often deprived of meaningful and again, perceptive and reliable information that would help us make sense of 
Why are our lives like that? Why do we live in a society structured around disempowerment rather than empowerment? And in response to that situation, which is not a fun life to be living in many ways, in response to that situation, it is very tempting to say, well, actually, while the elite that is in power, according to the conspiracy framework, may have uh, special access to the corridors of, of power, we, the exposers of the conspiracy, we, the conspiracy theorists ourselves, we have special access to knowledge about what's really going on in the world. And that sense of a special empowerment on the part of the conspiracy theorists that can really help to offset the very real actual experience of disempowerment that most of us have to butt up, have to sort of butt into day after day after day in our society. So I think I will wrap things up there and encourage a free-flowing conversation. So I, mean, I must say, I mean, well, I think the points that you've made, these 10 or 11 points that you've suggested, I mean, are very are astute observations of how conspiracy theory works. Also, looking down the list, um, I just, I think we can replace conspiracy theory with just about anything. These all seem to me to be the exact points, elements of any theoretical discourse whatsoever. Um, I mean, we can replace as long, the only difference that I see that you're making, which I think is an important difference, is that you're allowing a non-exclusivity. So in other words, you're saying, well, there's all these things contributing to the whole. But the fact is, most people, um, I think, and I'm not accusing anybody in this room of doing that, but most people who believe in hierarchy as um, the prime motivator or class struggle or whatever, I mean, these are all just larger forms of conspiracy theories which defer the attention from organization in individuals to organizations within an idea and within a theory and a discourse. And so, like, looking at this list, I mean, I can replace, you know, class struggle with conspiracy theory in most of these cases, um, in almost all of them, actually. And I, and I don't think... I just, I mean, I think that it, they also rely on plausibility arguments, you know, when it all comes down to it. So I don't really, I guess I'm, I just don't see the difference. Um, so that's... <laughs> Very good. What I want to do is get, is get other folks involved instead of just going back and forth each time, if that's okay with folks. Yeah? Do you want to jump in? Yeah, I, I really sort of wanted to add to this... Uh, are you familiar with uh, C.V. McPherson's book, Democracy in Alberta? Indeed. Okay. Um, do you want me about, just to about yeah, sketch the argument? Please. Because uh, McPherson argues basically that, that impenetrability is largely a function of the class position of the uh, conspiracy theorists or the adherents of such a... In, in Alberta, social credit, which was a rather kooky right-wing development of uh, sort of monetarism was very popular among the small farmers and shopkeepers. And these were people who thought of themselves as owners and they accepted the idea that well, it was the ownership society to coin a Bushism. And um, they were in fact functionally proletarians in this. They were certainly entirely subject to a market which treated what they did as commodity production and they were limited in what they could do. But unwilling as they were to face their own subjection to the market, believing in or holding desperately to the belief that they were owners like the big guys and that they could make their own lives, the only explanation that they could come up with for their own oppression was that this basically good system was being rigged. And, and social credit develops as it goes on into anti-banker and anti-Jewish because you have to have somebody doing the rigging rather than seeing that you are participants in a, in a large-scale process that systematically disempowers you and that, in fact, you have become systematically disempowered. So, um, and, you know, I, I think you can take that as well to the temptation to 
forget that social process is a form of self-creation and that social change is a process of self-change. And if you assume yourself to exist in some way outside the process, then in a way you place yourself in the same position. You know, you're beginning to, to see, well, then, then the, I can choose how the world should be, and if the world isn't like that, then it's, you know, then it's because somebody is fixing it behind the scenes. The folks had responses to, that was a, you asked a really challenging question about, about the analysis we've been laying out. You, you want to jump on that one? Yeah, I mean, the, and I, I apologize, I missed the first part of your talk. It's probably the first four or something, so maybe some of these got covered there. But um, yeah, I mean, even your example then about uh, the electoral process. So at, at some level, if, if it is about um, something about either a group or a center to a structure that then people fixate on, then one can easily then be led to the claim that um, the anti-Bush sentiment, because it's become a sentiment and it's because it's fixated on an image and you know, the, the crossed out of the face, the face itself becomes, stands in for a series of things, that voting itself ends up being you know, uh, uh, driven by conspiracy theory. Boot, boot the bad guys out, and then, well, we don't know what's going to happen next, but it's better than the bad guys, right? Uh, so, so that's one way in which you know, conspiracy theory then bleeds out into a number of possibilities that we wouldn't typically think of as conspiracy theories. But, um, but if it's you know, partially just you know, finding a, 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 a center to a structure and just filling that center with all kinds of um, either mode of production, be it a, a group of individuals, it could be a number of things, but discursively it functions in a similar way. But actually, can, if I can actually ask a broader question, which is, um, as you mentioned, there's been decades of this kind of research on the left, and, um, uh, and sometimes... Berlet, for instance, you know, ends up repeating a very similar set of tropes about conspiracy theories. The right wing is somehow, you know, seeping in and, 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 and surreptitiously drawing, pulling the left away through conspiracy theories, um, and it's a very conspiratorial narrative about about the shadowy figures of the right, um, and uh, which is fine. I mean, that's fine too, but, but it's rarely acknowledged that way. But my question is, you know, what what is this anxiety on the left? Um, uh, and it goes at the theoretical level with, with Frederick Jameson too. Is this you know conspiracy theories are poor person's cognitive mapping? I'm not sure what a rich person's cognitive mapping would be, but uh, but he um, uh, uh, you know so there's this and it isn't even just on the on the left as we know it right consensus historians like Hofstetter uh, in the 60s. Um, this was this threat, the threat of irrationality taking over politics, the threat of extremism taking over politics, and it, you know and I just I just don't know though what um, what what is essentially feared at, at that moment, right? I mean, why isn't it about, okay, this particular theory, we can work with this one or maybe not that one. What is this about conspiracy theories as such that has some kind of unity that then becomes a threat the, um, to uh, leftist uh, activism and politics? It's, just, it's, uh, it's, it's often uh, confusing. Yeah, I guess, I, I, on some level, I guess I want to play devil's advocate or I'd somehow engage with you along the question of, of where you're making a distinction between, okay, if we jettison Bush and Rumsfeld and, and the rest of the cabinet to some other place versus a systemic kind of critique. So if we push, get rid of Bush and Rumsfeld, suddenly we return to this state where we have power or whatever, um, and, and really instead arguing that, well, we need to have a systemic critique, which allows us to understand that it's not necessarily these individual actors who are responsible for the conditions that we face in this particular moment. And I think... Obviously, that's a very important piece to hold on to and, and, and an important foil to use against conspiracy. But what seems to me to be attractive about conspiracy or some other kind of analysis that looks at individual actors is that I think on some level we also have to be able to be cognizant that some actors do have more power and can play more of a role in any kind of circumstance than others can. So, you know, whether, you know, we say, like, look at Bill Gates, you know, what Bill Gates can do on a daily basis versus what probably any of us in this room could do is really quite different. And the kind of power that he can wield is really quite different. So the notion that, that some individuals are privileged in society to be able to act in ways that others can't is, I think, a very attractive piece of conspiracy theory, which draws people into it. And I, and I, while I, I agree that it's very problematic to use that, I also think that it's insightful that certain actors do have an ability to act in ways that others don't. And whether, you know, just as an example, and maybe Brian can fill this example in a little bit more clearly, like looking at biotechnology in the United States, you know, 
during the Clinton administration, here you have a president whose personal attorney used to be, you know, related to the Monsanto administration, and then you have, you know, the two people who write legislation that principally governs how genetic organ uh, genetically modified organisms in this country are are allowed to be are are from the Monsanto Corporation, so that we see actually very clearly individuals being involved in processes which result in very tangible things. And maybe we can use some of these 10 or 11 points and it sort of analyze in, well, you know, we're making some conjectures and, you know, we could, we could blank out the names and, the, and this, this story would still continue. And I just, I guess I don't, I don't know where that where the give is between being able to say this is a st systemic critique and these are individual actors. And I think that's the very difficult part of conspiracy theory is because on some level there are attractive pieces there because it does say that actors have intentions and they have desires and goals that lead us in particular directions. And how do we differentiate out those desires and goals from conspiracy to a systemic critique. I mean, how do we overlap those in, in, in a way that makes sense? Just a brief question. Is I, uh, what's the name of the book, uh, What's Wrong with Kansas, that some professor or somebody came out with? And they were using a, uh, it's interesting how uh, the analysis was how the right uses class war to talk about the cultural wars, these, the middle class is shrinking, the blue collar jobs are getting thrown overseas, now the white collar jobs are getting outsourced. So people are being disenfranchised, as you said quite well, uh, they don't have any power or whatever. And then they have this anger, right? So the left can't connect with these people for some reason, I don't know, but the right goes in there and says, guns, gods, and gays. There's this le liberal elite controlling your life and you can't have prayer in school, da, da, da. And then they get, all, they get people all pissed off, especially about abortion and stuff. Mm -hmm. And then the idea is you never change. You, you, they elect the Republican congressman. He or she gets elected. Then they just outsource all the jobs. The factories leave the town. Every, you know, the, uh, take, you know, cut the health care, et cetera, et cetera. And, but they're using this kind of conspiracy theory that there's people in Washington, this liberal elite media or whatever it is, that are <coughs> controlling everything. And... And uh, I'm not sure how I'm going with this argument or the idea, but but uh, but it's so powerful. It wins elections. It it it. Uh, uh, how do you counter that, or how do you? <laughs> you know, because people believe in it, it. It connects to people's emotions, to their feelings, to to a mythological type of thinking. Almost, and then you connect that to the religious right, which has their own mythology, and it's quite. I find it like threatening or scary because uh uh you know it's it's how do you uh how do you <laughs> how do you fight that i guess i'm not sure if that's the right kind of question but that's what i'm thinking to, to my mind it's exactly the, it's, it's it's the kind of question that we that anarchists i think would do well to to grapple with a little more strongly i don't know how, how well folks know tom frank's work he was one of the one of the people behind the baffler and his new book is called what's wrong with kansas um I would say that, well, actually, I would make a distinction, first of all, that I think there, there can be a difference between a genuinely conspiratorial framework about the liberal elites controlling our lives, on the one hand. On the other hand, a lot of what I heard you saying was basically a somewhat different phenomenon, which is a set of cultural resentments against the people who do actually set the tone for the New York Times and a lot of CBS and ABC, et cetera, et cetera, from the standpoint of people who share, and this is not my standpoint, and I am not uh, justifying this, but trying to analyze it, from the standpoint of people who have a strongly uh, particular version of Christian view of the world, a strongly conservative uh, view of the world, which by no means is restricted to, to Kansas, um, or to the United States for that matter, for those sorts of people, it, and again, if you bring in the class position argument that you mentioned, which is crucial to, to McPherson, which I totally failed to even mention in my thing, um, thank you for bringing it up. When you, when you bring those factors together, it can be an entirely legitimate response to the kind of stuff that you are likely to read in many of the newspapers and in many of the, here in many of the television programs, et cetera, et cetera, to complain that this is an alien culture. This is an, an actual liberal elite that makes more money than we, quote, we do, uh, that has a different set of values than we do, that lives a totally different lifestyle than, than we do. In fact, that usually lives in different places than we do. They, they, live, they live inside the Beltline. They live in Manhattan. They live in Hollywood. They live in, uh, you know, 
Miami. And right there, you can already, I don't know, how, again, how well folks know the, the historiography of anti-Semitism, for example, but you, and not just anti-Semitism, but you can see some immediate connections between a set of cultural resentments, which are, you know, on the face of them, well, I just disagree about the cultural choices that those folks have made, but it's not like I can insist that they change their own values or something like that. When we have a political disagreement, that's a disagreement about an institution. Because these but, people are one-issue people. It's like abortion or whatever. That's the only thing they care about, right? I'm sometimes. sorry for interrupting. No, 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 that's cool. So, sometimes I think they, they are interesting. The people, the folks that I know in my own circle of families and Our friends and coworkers are, are multi-issue people. They, they don't always, they don't do the conspiratorial thing of trying to connect up each and every one of their favorite issues in one grand uh, narrative, but they do have, uh, they do have a multiple uh, set of issues that, that animates them. So I want to acknowledge that it is possible to have a set of resentments, none of which I share, but which are um, acceptable within the confines of a genuine democratic public discourse that aren't necessarily conspiratorial, but ca that can very easily lend themselves yeah. to a, con a conspiratorial explanation that then seems to offer to the people who hold those cultural commitments, that then seems to offer, aha, this at last makes sense of my discontent with so much of what I read, so much of what I hear, so much of what I have to have to see on a daily basis around me. Unfortunately, that analysis does not get to the, to the really challenging questions that Arthur and Andre brought up about um, exactly how do we do that difficult job of, of finding the line between a genuine institutional analysis, and I'm not, I think I would partially disagree. I, th I think there are versions of, for example, class struggle anarchism that, that don't, to which my, 11, my catalog of 11 criteria would not very clearly apply, but there are other versions of it to which that catalog uh, uh, you know, could, could easily apply. And the trick is to find in our own political work, whatever our you know, specific version of anarchism is that we're drawn to, to try to, to try to look at that line really clearly and see where are we arguing more for an institutional structural analysis, which is what I sort of want us to argue for, and where are we falling prey to, sometimes even unconsciously falling prey to, the easier sort, the more superficial sort of uh, conspiratorial analysis. Yes? Yeah. Your critique focused on conspiracy theories where, you know, there's a group of people in power screwing over the rest of us. Would you say um, your same critique goes for conspiracy theories focused on certain events, which might be grounded in some truth, or might not, but... I'm not sure what you mean. What, what sort of events? I don't know, you know, like Area 51, JFK, or... For one that concerns us and might be grounded in truth, COINTELPRO, Earth First, and Judy Barry, that's a good example. Excellent example. Um, yes, I did, to answer your first question, I did mean my, the, the very general abstract criticisms that I was laying down to apply to a broader set. I guess I came up with examples that were all about specific groups, but I also think of, I think of JFK conspiracy theorizing as an excellent example. All the stuff about, folks know where Area 51 is? What is it, Nevada, Utah? Uh, <laughs> They're all the same Vermont. to me, New Mexico. Area 51. I'm really sorry. I'm not, I'm not from the Southwest. It's all just one big desert to me. Um, all, I'm a terrible Midwestern bias. All, all of that stuff is, is what I meant to include in my, in my probably too broad conception of what counts as conspiracy theory. Um, the, the Earth First thing in 1990, 1990 was that it, when the bombing happened? 89? Anyway, uh, when, when Judy Berry and uh, what's his name, Daryl? Yeah, when, when, when their car got uh, blown up. That is a good example of where, well, some, somebody did uh, that bombing. It was obviously not the kind of thing that was... <laughs> The mere expression of you know, a, a long-standing set of institutional relationships, it involved a lot of those long-standing institutional relationships, but it, it, it involved some sort of conspiratorial organizing. Somebody had to you know, illegally make this bomb and then attach it to the, what do they put it, under her seat or something in the car, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I have to confess that I have paid very little attention to the particular unraveling of the details that Judy herself before her death, and that I think Daryl's still working on this, isn't he? That, and that some of their comrades are, are, are still working on it. I have no idea. I have no position on whether it wa wasn't there a suspicion that an FBI agent was one of the people who... I just don't know. I believe they did get rewarded a massive amount of money because the government, because the FBI did try to like set up fake evidence and that was brought out, but sure. nobody well, they tried really to blame knows. Them. Yeah. Yeah. They tried to blame the, the, the two victims of the crime. It really does. It really happened.
so there's plenty of conspiracy yes. theories still going around. I guess that's, that's the point I was getting at. I am myself an unfortunate, um, I am adding to the susceptibility of, toward conspiracy theory in this case, because I just don't know. And to be, it would be dishonest to say, well, I actually have a better theory of what happened that I have no theory of what happened that day. And, and given that fact, given the fact that it's not like the FBI immediately released all of their files or that the local San Francisco cops released all of their files about the surveillance that had been going on, it's not like we have a lot of sources of, of information for, for moments like that when our own to the extent that I, I see them as to an extent my, my comrades, given the political disagreements, when our own comrades are getting you know, uh, uh, blown up, we obviously, for obvious reasons, we're not anarchists, we're not going to be the first ones who have direct access to reliable sources about exactly how that happened, who was behind it, you know, uh, what led up to it. And given that vacuum of good information, it's really easy to fill it up with questionable uh, information.